This from John chapter 3, a very, very short one, just two verses from Jesus' teaching of Nicodemus the Pharisee. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Paul writing to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, becoming uh, like Jesus. Uh, one of the things about discipleship, it would have been so much easier... If we were in Galilee by the lakeside and Jesus comes along and he invites us into discipleship. And what he did was, uh, it was very simple. He just said, follow me. Follow me. That's all you had to do. And when you followed Jesus, it was interesting. It was not follow me and do a course. Follow me, I'll go along to the School of Discipleship at the Diocese and do this training, or attend a meeting, or, or sign on the dotted line. Discipleship meant following Jesus into everything. You got to see what Jesus was doing. You got those intimate times of reflecting on, why are you doing that like that? You got to see how we peeled the spuds if they had spuds in those days, but they probably didn't. You got to see how um, he ate his food. You got to see how he dressed himself. You got to see how he would go to sleep. It's about being with Jesus in the whole of life. As he called people to follow him, there was this something of look and see but there's also an expectation of, look and see what I'm doing, now go and do. They became just from passive observers to active agents for Jesus and his coming kingdom. And I do love uh, the outline that you've got uh, around discipleship. Discover God through Jesus. And, and then we're into this next mast of the little ship, which is um, become like Jesus and then live like Jesus lived. Wouldn't it be so simple? If we were just there, back in those days, we would be the best disciples ever, wouldn't we? I know I would. <laughs> you would as well, I can tell. Because it would have been so much easier. Or was it? I want to remind you of a time uh, when Jesus said to someone, Follow me. In fact, it was a real keeny who came up to him. And he said, Lord, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven, to, to be this amazing disciple? And Jesus kind of uh, looks at this chap we love, and there's a bit of going on, well, you need to keep the commandment. Oh, yeah, I'm 
doing all of that. I'm doing, I've done the course. I'm doing all of that. And then at the end of all of this, Jesus says, uh, you lack still one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. This invitation to follow me, it's shocking. What was his response? He was sad. Following Jesus, and it evokes sadness. Why? Well, it really is the rub of discipleship here. Jesus, uh, in, in verse 23, says, When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard. This is a real rub of discipleship. How on earth can we get things right in this whole area of wealth uh, and possessions? Well, hopefully, we'll have a bit of a better idea. But I do want to wave a little flag. It's not the easiest thing to do. It is one of the most challenging things we need to do in our discipleship. But I want to say it's one of the most rewarding things in our discipleship if we get this right. You see, elsewhere in the scripture, Jesus points out uh, the secret for solving this dilemma of the hardness of it all. He points out uh, the older woman who's coming to bring her offering in the temple and she drops two, two tiny coins into the offering and Jesus points at her and says actually it's more about an attitude than arithmetic attitude is the most important thing not arithmetic so let's everyone breathe a sigh of relief <sighs> sorry for those of you that like spreadsheets but this is about attitude rather than arithmetic uh, today. So what is the foundation for our attitude? The foundation came from our very first Bible reading. Probably the most famous verse out of the Bible, John 3.16. And it emanates... From love. For God so loved. It's out of the very nature and being of God about love that we find this foundation of the right attitude. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. God's love is expressed first and foremost. Through generosity. That's the very nature of who God is. He loves, he gave. He gave his son. And that is the foundation for our attitude. It's about the generosity of God. If we want to be Christians, those little Christ, those little followers of Jesus, we need to have uh, that right attitude. You see, the generosity of God was modelled by Jesus. The right attitude was modelled by Jesus. Jesus said, I do what I see the Father doing. The generosity of God was modelled by Jesus. Uh, it's there in the Gospels of him going around. What, 5,000 people? Yeah, we can feed all of these. What? Five loaves, two fishes? No problem. Twelve baskets left over. 
How abundant and wonderful is that generosity? I particularly like the one of a bit of a difficulty going off at a wedding. Six stone jars of water used for purification. Forget about that, mate. Here's the best wine ever. Hundreds of bottles of wine. The best to last. What's happening here? What generosity is modelling? And there you're only in chapter 2 of John's Gospel. There's more to come. Then there's the generosity, I thought, of time. The generosity of time. Jesus is on an urgent mission. Why? Because the synagogue, uh, the leader of the synagogue, his daughter, is seriously ill. He needs to get along and save and heal her. Off he goes on a mission. What happens? Someone touches him as he's pressing through the crowds. Jesus is generous with his time. He stops in the middle of this urgent mission and he turns around to the woman and and turns around to the crowd and says, who touched me? This woman who's been healed uh, from severe bleeding for 12 years, she kind of comes forward. Jesus has an amazing word for her to ensure she understands how she's been healed, Uh, not just healed, but restored as well. And then off he goes back on his urgent mission. That generosity of time of Jesus. There's the generosity of his service. Uh, When he washes the disciples' feet, he washes all of their feet. Whenever we try doing it on Monday, Thursday in churches I've been in, well, we'll just have one person as an example. No, Jesus does every single one. The generosity of his service. And then the generosity of his silence as he stands before Pilate and accused of all kinds of things. And supremely, the generosity of stretching his arms out on the cross to die for you and me, to express his love through generously giving of himself and his life. His generosity. Those disciples who were following him knew it. They experienced it. And they were challenged enough to live it out. And so we come uh, to our second reading, uh, Philippians, uh, which verses um, are known as the uh, Philippian hymn. It wasn't written by Paul. It was written by, well, it was one of the first hymns and and great affirmations that they they sang and said in the early church. That's why in in an old-fashioned Bible, as in paper one, it's written out funny. Because it's a hymn Paul is quoting. This is some real truth about Jesus. One of the first things that's written down about uh, the attitude of Jesus. We see it written down. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Jesus, yes, he was the son of God. Yes, he'd come down from heaven, was incarnate, lived amongst us in non-theological terms. Jesus was selfless. He didn't look to his own interests and what he deserved. He was selfless in his humility. Rather, it goes on in verse 7, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. When it says he made himself nothing, um, there's a big theological thing going on on there in the the Greek word, echinosis, which means uh, he emptied himself he emptied himself he didn't kind of hold on to some stuff he gave everything as he emptied himself for the sake 
of others. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus models sacrifice. Jesus models sacrifice. The giving up of me for others. Jesus models that generous attitude. And how does that passage uh, begin in verse 5? You are to have the same attitude as Jesus. Have the same attitude as Jesus. Yes, there's something there about selflessness, something about emptying, giving of ourselves, and something about sacrifice. Now, um, hear what I'm saying. You are not Jesus. You are you. You are one of his disciples. You do not go to the extent that Jesus went to by dying on a cross. He has given us that example attitude for us to have and for us to be living out. So, it's good to see that attitude, but it's even better to apply that attitude to our living. And I want to explore this now. How do we do the things Jesus was doing? How do we exhibit that attitude in these areas of money, serving, and time I want to look at? How do we exhibit that generosity? And I'm going to deal, first of all, with money. I love uh, talking about money, uh, especially in a cost of living crisis. I had to sit down and my wife had uh, had to wipe my face with a towel because I was sweating, I was palpitating. The price of cheese, how much that's gone up in the shops. I'd not been shopping for a few weeks and it's kind of, have I got the wrong currency going on here or something? We're in a cost of living crisis. Um, And for some of you, it really is a crisis. Or you know people for whom this crisis is not just real, but it's tragic. I want to begin with some uh, good news about money. The first thing about this is, we've got a freedom about money. Scripture tells us. It's not yours. It's actually God's. 1 Chronicles 29, David says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendour, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All that I have isn't mine. The good news is it's God's. I'm asked to be generous with what God has handed me with. And the second note of freedom in this, because actually, if I think this isn't mine, this is the stuff God has entrusted to me to be generous with. The second bit of freedom that I also want to say is, um, you may um, be struggling because the arithmetic's not adding up. And the other big thing around money is the whole thing about debt. And the Bible tells us that debt is a real evil. It's awful because of what it does to human beings. It shrivels them up in shame. It's not talked about. It defines them. Christ has set us free. Debt is seen as evil. We've got something that we want to do about debt. And if your uh, cost of living crisis involves something around debt, there are people to talk to. There are websites to visit. Christians Against Poverty. What an amazing thing in the battle against evil as they help people uh, work through debt. 
who help people out of that shame to live the life that God wants them to live. Good news around freedom. Freedom from debt. Freedom from worrying about money. Freedom to make the right choice with money and not be sad. So, here are some practical things uh, for generosity. And I want to encourage you as to, actually as we want to grow in discipleship, what's going to be uh, your next step? And the first uh, way we often handle money uh, generously is when we kind of give to things casually. Uh, Remember the days when we used to have an offering plate instead of card readers and QR codes? There's something there, isn't there, about uh, that's a casual way of doing it. And that's really, really good that we can uh, do things quite casually. But the Bible has got uh, more wisdom on money. And it also talks about um, being generous uh, in a responsible kind of way. And that means meeting the needs. I don't know if you've ever seen your church's accounts. They should be public, so you can see them. And I hope you ask questions at your annual parochial church meeting of the treasurer. But one of the most interesting things that I've done on uh, some uh, discipleship groups that I've run is I've actually gone through uh, what it costs to run the church. And you know what? It's the most amazing thing for people. They had no idea what it costs. Something called heating, lighting. Something called insurance. Something that's called parish share and all things like that. So we need to give responsibly to meet the needs of what uh, our church needs to do its ministry. Meeting needs is one thing the Bible commends. But it's also got another model there, which is about giving um, proportionally. And the the word that's often used in the Bible is tithe, which represents uh, 10%. 10% of what you receive, give back to God. Um, That's what the Bible teaches, 10%. Church of England is slightly different in one of its reports, as I'm sure Colin Slater uh, passed on to you. It encourages people to give 5% to your local church and 5% to other things. You can do it on percentages of what you get in. Giving proportionally ensures it happens. But actually there's still another step that we can live out this generosity in. And that is giving uh, sacrificially. Giving sacrificially. What does that mean? It's getting back to that attitude again. It's giving uh, uh, money in such a way that I need to sacrifice something for it. I need to sacrifice um, buying a new gadget and going without. I need to sacrifice um, having a car that matches the neighbours. It may even be I need to sacrifice uh, going on holiday, as one of my friends uh, was saying. Uh, this just, oh, that's my holiday fund I wonder what you are being called to sacrifice that's part of that generosity that we see modelled that we see exemplified in Jesus the next area where we can be generous in give that generosity um, I will include this. Sacrifice about attitude. And generosity comes from love. For God so loved, he gave. Do you know what the greatest thing I ever received was? It was actually nothing. Nothing. I remember uh, my mum and dad, they were very proud. Uh, their, their son, first one in the family, is going off to college and university. I remember getting out of the car and getting all my 
bits together as a student. And I remember my dad saying to me, he says, uh, Richard, I'm sorry, um, uh, we've got nothing to, to give you because you've been un unemployed for quite a, a while and things have been tough at home. And he says, you know I would give you, I would give to you. I said, yes, Dad, I do. And that was the greatest gift that I'd been given in one sense. It was nothing. Why? Because actually it revealed something of the attitude that was behind it. It revealed a generosity that he was modelling that came out of love. That's how it works. Sacrifice and knowing it. And it affects us, doesn't it? With money and gifting. The next area, serving. We have been gifted with many different gifts or graces. And I've just uh, pulled out a couple of verses um, out of Ephesians 4. But it, it's, it's in other places in Corinthians and in Romans about the gifts that God has given to each one. Each one of you has been given gifts by God. And we are to be generous in using them. Why have they been given? They've been given for works of service so that the body of Christ may uh, be built up. I wonder how many of you have got um, a gift left in your living room from Christmas that's still wrapped up. Anyone fall into that category? Yes, because do you know what? When someone gives you a gift, you open it and you use it. The same with the gifts that God has given each of us. We are to be generous in how we use those gifts, in serving. Why? Because they're for another. How can you be generous in how you serve? Finally, I want to think about time. It's a bit of a weird one, this. Bear with me. Some of the most inter important turnings in the ministry of Jesus came from people interrupting him. Came from people who had a different agenda for what Jesus was trying to do. We've already said uh, that woman who reached out uh, to touch him. Uh, and then there's the time when some Greeks come along and say, hey, we want to see Jesus. And that reveals the great passion at journey. Now as the Son of Man going to be exalted. And I also think of another one which ties it in. Interruption is heading up to Jerusalem. It's going to be Passover. It's a really important time. And he's walking along and he eyeballs somebody out of the corner of his eye stuck in a tree what's his name Zacchaeus come on down I'm coming to your house for tea isn't it this ties us into the beginning with the rich young ruler who then can be saved is what the disciples say how does that encounter, that interruption by a guy dangling his legs from the branch of the tree above Jesus? What happens? Today, as he throws a feast for others, as he gives generously of all the money he's got and more, salvation has come to this house. Who then can be saved? Jesus, in his time, he stops to look at these feet dangling in front of him. And I wonder, I just wonder, how are we allowing ourselves to be interrupted? How are we allowing ourselves to respond in time? And this could just be sitting down with someone for a chat. It could be, oh, just popping in on someone on the way home. Or actually it could be just Give in a few minutes to pray for a situation that that needs prayer about. How are we allowing to be generous 
with how we use our time. In one sense, it, uh, it's a bit of an inverse you often find with money and time, isn't it? There's this thing of cash, uh, cash rich and time poor. Or plenty of time, but nothing to finance it with. I've got uh, youngsters who are students, or just come out of student things, and they're, they're kind of negotiating this kind of thing. But time is the same of money. It's about our attitude. What you can do with time is spend it just as you can spend money. But what attitude are we adopting in order to be generous? This is really crucial. And this, I'm saying, is one of the most um, big steps in discipleship. We need to learn to be generous. Because if we get it right... If we become like Jesus in our attitude of generosity, we do two things. Become more like him, we become closer to God. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. If our treasure is with God, our heart will be with God. We'll be closer with God. And we will be closer with one another. Why? Because we are loving one another even more and even better. Becoming more like Jesus through an attitude of generosity. It's a challenge. I don't want to say it's easy. And I can't say switch it on. It's a discipleship journey that we walk on. And as with most journeys, some, are more, some legs of it are more difficult than others. That's why we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. As we offer up our lives as we've already sung. As we respond the love of God and the generosity of God as we model that amongst us. Amen. 